started. Uh, my name's Fyodor from Insecure.org. Uh, thanks for showing up. Um, I think I have one of the more hardcore of DEF CON crowds here today. You know, so many people come on the weekends, but you guys managed to convince your bosses to let you skip a day at work, fly to Las Vegas, and attend this great hacker party. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, I was going to uh, just come here and party as well um, and not even speak. Um, but then I saw this network reconnaissance track, and that uh, got my attention, as it's a subject that is very near and dear uh, to my heart, as I'm the author and maintainer of a security scanner called NMAP um, that you can use um, uh, for these sorts of uh, um, techniques. I'm also going to discuss... Sorry? <laughs> I don't know if I can make it much louder, but I'll try my best. Uh, <laughs> All right, um, I'm also going to discuss other um, great open source network security tools, uh, such as the venerable HPing2. Um, just so I can get an idea of the audience and um, how much introductory NMAP material I have to cover, um, could I get a show of hands for anyone here who has ever used NMAP? <laughs> okay, that's pretty much all of you, um, which is great, because I wrote far too much um, to fit in 50 minutes, but I'm going to do my best um, so if I look rushed, that's why. Um, we'll start with the disclaimers, of course. Um, first of all, you'll notice, as opposed to many other um, presentations, um, we're using real host names and IP addresses here. Um, frankly, I sometimes get sick of seeing slide after slide of example.org, and this is a mock-up of a 192, 168 network and so forth. Plus, you know, I trust all you guys. You're not going to abuse the information. <laughs> but uh, more importantly, even if I didn't, um, this is really just public information scanning we're doing. You know, it's called network reconnaissance, and that's all we're doing. We're not going to be exploiting any hosts. We're not going to be getting root. We're just going to be rattling some doorknobs, maybe peeking in a window or two, you know. Um, also, I'm going to start with the basics um, as a foundation for kind of some of the more advanced stuff. So if five minutes from now you're saying, oh man, I was doing this stuff back in eighth grade, well, um, you know, hopefully it'll get better. So um, let's just start from the beginning here. Um, our first step is going to be taking our target company or whatever. Um, I don't remember if I mentioned that um, um, this talk is gained mostly to pen testers and such. Um, so if you got your client, um, the first thing you want to do is you might want to try DNS. You know, that's pretty obvious, right? Its whole point is to change names to IP numbers. So first we'll grab um, just the low-hanging fruit, just the information that companies have to give us in order for, um, you know, their mail and such to work. Um, so we use the dig command to um, grab kind of the basic information from at stake. And you see name server records, MX records, and the corresponding A records. They also have this bonus text record where security and business intersect. I think they're um, one of the few companies where they get so many probes that it makes sense to put advertisements in their DNS zone information. <laughs> so uh, what do we do next? Well, you know, let's try a zone transfer. Why not? You know, it may not always work, um, but when it does, you get a huge list of host names, IP address. Um, you can get ideas of the functions of the hosts from their names, from their C names. Um, poorly configured servers will give you vanity names that their sysadmin uses, far flung. Um, sometimes you even get internal network names, um, which is really bad, but that certainly doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Um, and popular name servers such as Bind um, make these, this information available um, by default. So yes, a lot of people turn it off, but when it's on by default, we all know that at least half of them <laughs> leave it as it is. Um, so here's just an example uh, where we grab the security focus zone, and um, you see a bunch of um, hosts here, which I've cut off um, due to space. Um, to their credit, um, they didn't have those problems like, you know, internal DNS or far-flung vanity names, um, but it still gives you a lot of IPs um, to start with in your reconnaissance. Um, another thing you want to try, of course, is the version number, and um, that's for one basic reason. As you all know, Bind has a long and sordid history of uh, remotely exploitable security holes, so if they're running an insecure version, you can skip the rest of this reconnaissance stuff and go straight to owning their name server. Um, the Bind people also have a useful page, most of you have probably seen, um, that lists um, all the different security holes in the different versions of Bind uh, that you can cross-reference to. Uh, when I tried a lot of popular companies, 
um, I got some interesting uh, flippant responses for a few. Uh, Playboy's version number is move on, I'm already patched, okay, thanks, bye. <laughs> um, Philip Morris says parent Altria, you are not cleared for that information. And Sands informed me that all accesses are logged. Damn. Um, so I actually thought that these might be some good companies to take a further look at because A, they're um, large companies, they can afford um, security staff. B, they've obviously made at least some attempts um, at securing and that you know they rejected the zone transfers, they put flippant remarks in their version numbers and so forth. Um, so I thought that would be more interesting than you know if we scan a totally open network, well, you know, duh, that's easy. Um, so let's go ahead at other ways. Um, I'm not going to talk much about Netcraft, but just to mention that that's sometimes underutilized in um, you know, gathering more information on the company. You can find domain names that are similar to the company names, uh, use similar. They took away that? Oh, bastards. <laughs> but there's still plenty of great um, features um, that you can use, such as you can detail down on each one, and I'll talk to Netcraft. Um, um, narrow down on each one um, to get the uptime graphs, to get the um, hosting history, and all sorts of goodies. And the great thing is that you know here you're totally anonymous since you know it's the Netcraft server you're querying, and most of these are in their cache. Um, the geographical IP registries are another place to start. Aaron, Ripe, Apnic, you know, find the contact information, emails, phone numbers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and you can basically take the seed numbers that you got from the previous stuff, you know, look up what networks they belong to, who administers them, what else that person administers, and keep cycling in this loop um, as you gain more and more IP addresses. Um, here's an example. We do a who is on Aaron with the string at Microsoft.com. And again, we see you know, pages and pages. This only goes up to H of uh, contacts there who um, we can not only find out what networks they run um, to find IPs, but we can save that information for further um, social engineering, drill down on each one for their address and so forth. Um, here's another example. We're going to do Aaron. Um, and here we give the query N, look for net blocks, with the name Playboy in it. And indeed, we get um, a whole bunch of responses. Now, obviously, companies can have similar names, so you want to go through and make sure, you know, look up each record, check the address, make sure it corresponds. Um, in this case, it does. So. Um, Obviously, this part can't be comprehensive because there's you know, any number of ways um, that you can find such thing. Um, one of the more fun ones, though, are the public route servers I've been looking at lately, um, such as traceroute.org gives you a list of Cisco boxes um, that have, you're publicly able to connect to them and get full BGP routing information um, so you can look up the AS numbers and so forth of the companies um, that you're interested in. Um, and many more techniques that I won't cover. But the point of that was just so that we can get the IP addresses um, that we're interested in doing um, further reconnaissance on. So using some of those techniques, I culled a bunch of networks um, from Playboy to use them as an example. Now, I did exclude certain net blocks, such as um, some of the gaming sites, because if a casino uh, was to catch you scanning them, they're liable to break your kneecaps. <laughs> so um, be careful with that. Um, you can see here that um, these are in kind of CIDR notation. So you have a slash 20 here, that's 4,000 hosts, a slash 24. Um, all the way down to here is just a dot 101 through 105. So that's only what, six hosts or five. Um, but uh, Nmap um, takes it in this convenient format um, so we can feed that in directly. So um, what are we going to start out with? Well, we don't want to start out with the ringing all the bells and whistles and IDSs and so forth. So we're going to start simple with the cautious approach, which in Nmap I call the list scan. So we're going to say hyphen SL, do a list scan, um, output to a file, and I give it all these addresses that we just looked at. And here, basically, all it's doing is going through each one and doing a reverse DNS lookup on it so we can kind of see what we're after. And this is important for a lot of reasons. For example, verification. You know, just because they own the IP blocks doesn't for sure mean that they're using them. They could be subletting to some other company um, some of the IPs. They could be sharing with some other company in the basement. Um, and so this, at least, we can look up the names and make sure that there's nothing too out of whack. Also, sometimes from the names, you can figure out what specific machines uh, you might want to dig into uh, for more information um, if you don't want to go after all of them uh, for reasons of subtlety. 
So uh, the next step, once we've done that, is the ping scan. We want to know which of these hosts are up and available. And so here I did the same thing. And a lot of people don't recognize how much more powerful the um, ping scanning techniques of Nmap have gotten recently. Um, you know, there was a day on the internet where you could just send an ICMP um, you know, echo request ping packet, and pretty much most of the machines that were up would respond happily. Um, nowadays, with so many filters and paranoia and such, um, you have to sometimes go a little bit further um, in probing the machines looking for any sort of response. So here we're saying, do a ping scan, SP. Um, use SYN probes um, against port 22, 25, 53, 80, 113, and 31, 338. I just picked a big one because sometimes firewalls um, only deal with the lower ports. Um, and that'll send a SYN request to each of those and expect a response back. Similarly, we do an ACK scan uh, to a number of ports, um, expecting a reset pack. Um, and a relatively new feature is hyphen PU, which sends a UDP packet um, to the ports that we specify and um, expects an ICMP port unreachable back. If it gets that, then it knows that they're up. So you can specify pretty much an arbitrary combination of all these different ways to try and elicit some sort of response from the hosts so that we can narrow it down um, from the more than 4,000 um, that we had listed before. Um, it also has PE, which is the traditional ping packet, and PM, which is an ICMP netmask request. And just for kicks, we set the source address on all the um, TCP and UDP probes to 53, because we've all seen once in a while some firewall admin will set up his new firewall, inexperienced firewall admin, and say, uh-oh, nothing's working. You know, DNS responses aren't coming back. Well, you know, there are right ways to fix it, and then there are easy ways to fix it. And uh, a lot of people pick the, well, you know, we'll just allow source port 53. You know, no one's going to notice that. You know, what are the chances the probes will come from there? So, you know, if we put it there just in case um, it might work. Other popular choices would be TCP port 20, because you have the same case with um, TCP, uh, FTP connections coming back. Um, and so we run that command, and it completes. And it said that of those 4,393 IP addresses, um, there are 950 of them up. I just showed a few examples here. Um, but with any tool, um, even Nmap, um, you want to make sure that you verify your results. Go through and look at the output file and make sure that everything makes sense. Uh, so here, you know, I look at the machine-readable output, which is what we see in front of us. And I see hundreds of machines, consecutive, that all look like they're up. And you know, that's a little bit suspicious, because you would think if they were real machines, you would see you know, a gap in somewhere. I mean, yeah, it could, and they don't even have reverse DNS. So yeah, it could be a cluster of machines that's very thick, but um, you kind of want to look into it more to make sure you don't waste too much time on machines that aren't really reachable. So um, one way to figure that out is say, well, which of these ping probes um, were those alleged up hosts responding to? And so MMAP has a feature, not added a, too, too long ago, um, hyphen hyphen packet trace, um, which will show you all the packets NMAP sends and receives. So we do a command just like the one before, but instead we just pick one of those possibly phantom hosts um, to look at and see what it's really responding to. So we see the ping requests, the UDP requests, the TCP SINs, TCP ACKs, and then down at the bottom here, um, you see this receive line saying that it's receiving a TCP reset from port 113 um, from the host. Now, those of you, again, who do firewalls know that 113, or the ident D port, is also an annoying one. You set up your firewall to block incoming connections, and then one of your users connects to a mail server or an IRC server, and it tries to connect right back to 113 um, to figure out what user is um, owning that connection. And if your firewall is blocking it, that can take a long time to time out and frustrate your users. And again, that leaves the admin with several possible options, and they don't always choose the right one. Um, sometimes they say, well, you know, we'll allow 113. It's only ident D. You know, what harm can it be? And that way it'll actually work. Um, with newer firewalls, most of the modern ones, you can say spoof a reset so that it looks like the machine is there and listening and just stopping the port 113 um, without having a long timeout. And so that leaves us in a quandary. We don't really know. You know, is the firewall here blocking the port and spoofing this um, packet allegedly from 140.226? Or did we find a hole that allows us to reach the machine behind it? And so you might want to think a little bit 
about if you were doing this scan, you know, what methods would you use uh, to determine what's really going on there? And I'll demonstrate a couple um, ideas, and then maybe you'll have some of your own ideas um, afterward. Um, so one thing we could try is the IP ID. Um, as most of you know, every IP packet in the header has an ID flag um, that's used for fragmentation um, reassembly, so it can figure out what IP packet a fragment belongs to. And so one thing with IP ID, though, is that implementers have a lot of leeway in how they implement it. Um, so they generally do the easy approach of just using a counter that goes from 0 to 65, 535, and then back to 0 again. With each packet they send, they increment it by 1. Um, other, a few other hosts use different techniques. So we're going to use the great HPing utility, which you probably all have, and if not, I stuck it on the DEF CON CD, um, to do a probe um, to port 113, a SYN probe on that machine. And we look at the responses with a particular emphasis on the IP ID that's in red. So for this first host, we see it's 4,700, 57,900, 9,400. It's a pretty random-looking distribution. And then we try another um, one of these hosts, and we look again, and shucks, it's another random-looking distribution. If we had seen that this one was incrementing from 4793 to 4794 to 4795, and this one was like 53009, 53010, you know, we would know that they were probably different machines because they're both incrementing, but they're on a totally different phase there. Um, in the same way, you could send a bunch of packets to one and see if it increments the IP ID of the other. Or if this one was random and this one was sequential, again, we'd see that it was something different. But unfortunately, this hasn't fully worked for us um, because they're both random. And that tells us that it's probably a firewall since they're the ones that usually do that. But systems like OpenBSD will do it too. Um, so this leads credence to the idea that the firewall is sending the packet back. But, you know, it could be a cluster of OpenBSD um, machines behind there. You never know. So uh, let's try something else then. Maybe Traceroute will help us. So we do a trace route um, to their mail server, mx.shy.playboy.com, and um, using the normal trace route command. And we see that it goes from San Jose to Chicago um, to the Playboy network, and then it stops at this F0-0, and it's filtered. And so we're not able to see you know, the destination host at all. So um, you know, 10 hops really isn't a lot. We would like to get all the way to the destination host. So instead, we're going to do a more custom trace route against the machine. Um, using HPing2 again, it's trace route mode. We do a trace route to port 25, because this is a mail server, so that instead of using the default UDP probe that gets filtered, hopefully the SYN packet to um, port 25 will make it all the way to the server um, so that mailers can make connections. And here we see it gets to 10, 11, no response, but 12, all of a sudden, we get a TTL from this fw.chai.playboy.com. I have to, yeah, I have to thank them for the great naming. It's really helpful. Like, their firewall is FW, it's in Chicago. Their mail server is mx.chai. Um, you know, that's real convenient, and I do appreciate it. Um, <laughs> but, um, and then we get a response from the actual host 13 hops away. Um, so that tells us that, um, you know, we know that the end host is apparently 13 hosts away, and we can get the response by going to port 25. Um, so now we'll try port 113, um, which is the port that was giving us trouble against the same host. And here we get to 10 like usual. 11 gives us nothing. But this time we're getting the response from the host at hop number 12. Um, whereas last time that's where the firewall was, and the real host was on 13. Um, so this pretty here gives us enough um, evidence to close the deal um, that it's really the firewall that's at hop 12, but it's just spoofing the packet to make it look like it's coming from 143.2, um, and it's sending a reset. And so that means we probably can't reach the machines at all. Um, does anyone have other ideas? Suppose this hadn't worked, and the IP ID failed as it did, and the trace route had failed too. Uh, what other techniques do you think we could have used to try and determine um, whether the host is spoofing the packet is alive or whether it's a firewall spoofing? ISN prober? Uh, 
Okay, that's great. He's suggesting a good tool called ISN Prober, which I haven't personally used. But instead of checking the IPID sequences, um, they would have checked the TCP ISN sequences. And so if it was like a 64K rule or Windows time dependent or such, um, we could see um, that they're on totally different phases or use different algorithms. What other techniques do you think you could use? Sure. Uh, time to lift, yeah, kind of like, you mean like we, we were doing here? Right, yeah, I think that's what we're doing here where we see that since it's 12, we know that it's spoofing it on the TTL. And since it's 13, um, we know that it's not. Anyone have other ideas? NBT stat? Okay, yeah, so if it's like a Windows host um, and it had those ports open, um, you could try that. Hopefully they wouldn't put their mail server on there, but you know, some people do. Okay, that's another great idea. See, there are a lot of ways to do it. His suggestion for people who didn't hear was to do an OS fingerprint, such as nmap-o, and you know, see if um, they match. Um, another technique for anyone who's read FRAC 60, um, someone wrote a real good paper on um, bad checksums. They found that many firewalls um, configured this way to respond to packets wouldn't even look at the checksum and would respond um, regardless of whether the checksum is valid. Whereas any decent end host, even a Windows host, is going to just drop that packet on the floor. So if we had sent our SYN packets from a, um, if we had sent it with a bad checksum and didn't get a response, you know, there's a good chance that the host was receiving it. Whereas if we got a response to a bad checksum, we would be pretty certain that it's the firewall, um, since no host um, would do that. So um, that's just an example of how there are a lot of means um, in your pen testing uh, to achieve the same ends. And sometimes you'll get frustrated by the first couple tries. Um, but you know, if you think about it, you can often find ways to get around um, these problems. A side note on host names, real quick. We noticed that um, mx.chai and fwchai were well named. Um, security focus wasn't quite as kind. I was looking through the zone transfer and saw Bugzilla. And I thought, hey, I know that bug tracking system. I, uh, I know an exploit for that. And so I tell them it in, and instead I get this Raptor secure firewall gateway and so forth. So you can't always assume that it's going to be, you know, exactly as they um, say. You know, host names go out of date. They may be trying to trick you, you know, or for whatever other reason. Um, so now the whole point of that exercise of finding out the 113 thing is that now we can redo our ping scan, and this time 113 is out of the picture uh, because we know that it's giving us unreliable results. And this time, we only see 71 hosts up, um, as opposed to the 950 that we got before. Um, and so that's a much more manageable number uh, for us to deal with. Um, so I just use a quick, easy command to grab all the IP addresses um, from our nmap log and put them in a file. And I also added that fw.chi, um, because the filtering on that was good enough that it didn't respond to any of our ping probes. Um, however, thanks to the little expedition we did, um, we found it via the um, custom trace route. And so, of course, we want to scan it, too. So now I'm going to move to a slightly different tangent. We'll go back to those um, later. Um, sometimes what you really want to do is uh, do a fast single service sweep. So hypothetically, suppose there was a huge Windows RPC DCOM exploit on the loose, um, and you wanted to scan all your systems really fast before the attackers do um, for port 135. One, one, of course, you know, it can potentially be exploited on other ports, but that's the main one. Um, and so Nmap has what I call a turbo mode um, that supports that to make it really fast. Now, for Playboy, I'm not going to scan 135. Um, given the nature of their sites, I decided I wanted to find web servers. Um, and so here we're, um, say, do a SYN probe to port 80. Um, do a SYN scan, and we want to scan for port 80. And Nmap will be smart enough to say, hey, you know, the ping probe is already sending a SYN packet and getting a reset or a SYN ACK, so let's skip the whole port scan and just use the ping probe results um, to give you what you need. And so this was able to scan those 4,397 hosts in just um, a little under a minute, um, which can be handy. 
Sometimes I get emails from people saying, dude, Nmap is so slow. I wrote my own scanner and it can scan, you know, a class B in 10 seconds and it's only 20 lines of code. You know, it's just a for loop that, uh, you know, goes through and send, 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 send. But the problem, of course, is, you know, it can scan really fast, but the results aren't going to be accurate as all, at all. Um, Nmap has to be very careful about remembering all the probes it has sent, uh, retransmitting if it doesn't get a response, detecting dropped packets, looking at latency, um, adjusting the parallelism accordingly. Um, whereas if you just have a for loop that just scans real quick, you know, it's liable to be all dropped 90% of your packets at the first bottleneck router on the route between the machines. Um, one thing that just slightly modifies from that is if you want to do an inter internet-wide ping sweep. Um, so here we're using a feature of Nmap called IR, input from random, um, which just, and it now takes an argument. It used to just go forever. Um, however, sometimes that makes it easy to start it up going and then forget about it, and then it'll scan for good and you'll get up the next morning with angry messages from your ISP, or so I hear. Um, <laughs> so um, after that happened, I added a feature that lets you limit it to, in this case, 10,000 hosts. So here we're saying pick hosts at random, um, do this fast since sweep for web servers. Um, so you can use this as an alternative um, browsing approach. Instead of search engines, you can just find your web servers randomly and uh, see what you get. They just pop up one after another. Of course, you'd have to be pretty bored to do that, but um, you know, if you wanted to, it's there. And it kind of looks like sort of a script kitty feature, um, but actually I can find it uh, quite useful in a number of cases. If you want to do surveys of certain ports, see how many people are running whatever, um, you can get a lot of good information just by doing a random scan. Okay, so now we're going to get more intense with these Playboy IPs that we've found. Um, so here we're going to say, Nmap, don't bother pinging it because we already know that they're up. Um, do a SYN scan, an OS scan. We give it this OS scan underscore guess, which wasn't documented until recently. Um, and basically, the problem we encounter when I did normal OS detection is that those 113 ports that were coming back, the resets, those weren't from the machines at all. Those were from the um, you know, firewall forging them. And so Nmap got a little bit confused because um, those resets didn't match what it would have expected from the true destination host. Um, however, this OS scan guess will say, hey, even if you don't have a perfect match, um, you know, just give the closest match. And that's usually pretty effective. Um, T4 is a timing option we'll talk about later. We want to scan all of the ports, and I mean all of them. Um, Nmap used to just do 1 through 65, 535. Um, but um, this year I added the port zero support, which is a pretty bogus port, but you know, some people wanted to scan it, so why not? Um, we give it the list of IPs, tell it to log to a file, and we're off. Um, so let's just take a look and try and analyze some of the results. Um, let's take a look. Um, one thing, we have this router here. Um, it looks like it's a Cisco. It's got all the ports, and this is a line that a lot of people don't pay enough attention to. Here we see that the ports that were scanned but not shown are in state closed, meaning there's not really much of a firewall protecting them. So if the ports were open, um, you know, they would be available to users as opposed to a more proper default deny stance where they say only allow the ports um, that I specifically want to be allowed. Um, so for example, they probably didn't have a real great reason for having finger open. It's probably not necessary on the router for external internet users. Um, but because they have this default allow policy, you know, it was up and available. Whereas at this host, um, we see that the default is filtered. Um, and so hopefully they only have ports open that they have a good reason for. Um, let's take a look at another one. Um, this one's bigip2chai.playboy.com. And one thing I found really interesting on this guy is that um, the OS guest said that it's an F5 Labs Big IP load balancer, which is probably true given the name of the host. And what's interesting is that, you know, I certainly don't have one of those in my lab um, to add that fingerprint. And so a feature that has turned out really useful in Nmap is that if it doesn't detect an OS, it gives you a fingerprint and a web page where you can submit it. And a lot of really helpful users have submitted thousands of these fingerprints. And so that the database now includes everything from Xboxes running Linux to Amigas to VoIP phones, PBXs, and F5 Labs big IP load balancers. 
Um, has anyone here ever submitted a fingerprint? Okay, mad props to you guys because um, that's what's helped it uh, to be so up to date. When people submit one, you know, then everyone can benefit if they ever do see that weird uh, type of machine somewhere. Um, let's look at a couple more examples. Um, here's one. It looks like it's an ad server in Chicago. And um, their default state is filtered. Good. Not many ports open. Um, the fact that they have Oracle open is kind of questionable. Um, you know, just because Larry Ellison says it's unbreakable doesn't necessarily mean um, that it's a good idea to leave it open flapping in the wind. Uh, but at least you can see they made some efforts here in terms of the default filtered. And you can see the OS guess says that it's Solaris 2.6 or 7 and that they've specifically changed the TCP strong ISS variable uh, to give them stronger um, initial sequence number generation uh, to make it hard to do TCP spoofing attacks. Um, here's another uh, machine that's on kind of the same class C um, where they haven't taken as much care. Um, the default state is closed. It's got more hosts open. And it has my SQL, which is you know, just as bad. Um, so now we're going to move to um, a few um, other tricks um, that can be handy. Um, first, let's look at IPv6 scanning, um, which Nmap now supports. So I take a machine. I use www.came.net just because they have some good IPv6 network, so I knew they supported it. And I do a scan of them, and we see a number of open ports. Um, but we also see all these filtered ports here um, that we're not able to get to because of some filtering system. Well, let's take exactly the same command, um, but add hyphen 6 so that it scans the IPv6 version instead. Here you see that um, suddenly there are no open, no filtered ports. And this port 113 that was filtered in the previous one you know, is now open. So you could take your IPv6 enabled RPC info and interrogate the ports further. Um, so that's something that can sometimes be useful to try. And it's going to become more useful if and when <laughs> IPv6 starts seeing more um, usage. Another thing that people are often interested in is how to get the timing right. You know, MMAP offers a lot of options. Max parallelism, min parallelism, min RTT timeout, max RTT timeout, initial RTT timeout, a host timeout, a scan delay. So if you want to get your scans faster, all you really have to do is pick the exact right values for each of these variables, and everything will be set. Um, fortunately, there's a better way. And that are these um, canned timing levels I added, um, which tries to do the smart things um, but lets you configure kind of how aggressive it wants to be. It can be everything from paranoid, which does only one probe every five minutes. So yes, you're going to stay under the IDS port scan detection thresholds, but you're going to be old and gray by the time <laughs> any scan actually finishes, um, unless it's a real small, very limited um, scan. Um, sneaky is kind of the same, except it's 15 seconds. And you can use numbers here from 0 to 5 instead of the names if you want. Um, polite. Uh, normal mode, which is kind of the default. And then there's aggressive mode, which is something I've worked a bit on. By default, you know, I think Nmap needs to err on the side of being conservative with how fast you know, it does its scan. Because it doesn't really know for sure about all the network infrastructure in between. You know, for all it knows, you could be on a 300 baud slip link to Pakistan or something. Um, and so it has to be safe so that I would rather have it be slower you know, in the case where you're on a faster network than if you're on a slow network and um, get wrong results. Um, however, with this aggressive mode, I've tried to make it so that if you're on at least a somewhat reasonable network, you know, if you're on an Ethernet or even a broadband um, connection, or possibly even a modem, although I don't know, um, this will be much more aggressive in its timing um, while still providing accurate results, you know, assuming you know, the um, latency and such and packet loss aren't horrible um, on that network. So um, let's look at ways that you can speed your scan and some of the things that I've been adding lately. Um, here we do a scan with an older version, 3.15 beta 3, against insecure.org. See, I actually scan my own system sometimes, too. It's not only other people. Um, and here it scans the 1,600 default ports in a little less than 10 minutes, which isn't a disaster, um, but it still will take a long time if you have a lot of um, hosts which are firewalled in this sort of way. Um, so I made a bunch of changes to the timing algorithm, which in the next version of Nmap was able to do the same thing in 228 seconds, which, hey, you saved half your time. Um, but even better is if you add the T4 option, you know, all of a sudden it only takes 41 seconds. 
And so if you're doing big scans, if you're doing scans against um, heavily firewalled hosts and you're on a decent network, you know that's something that you might want to consider using um, on a more regular basis. Um, now let's look on a different track, um, avoiding the IDSs. Um, there are a few different ways um, that you can do this. Um, one of them is the scan flags option, um, which lets you specify um, different flags for a certain scan you want to do. Um, for example, one fact that seems to be little known by certain IDS vendors is that you can do a SYN scan. You know, it doesn't have to be just SYN. You know, a SYN fin, for example, um, will often do the same thing. And so with scan flags, you can say, do a SYN scan, but instead of using the default flags, use these TCP flags instead. And here's an example. The same thing with like the fin scan. Um, you know, a lot of other combinations will work, such as push urge. Um, and another approach, instead of avoiding the IDS entirely, is you can try and avoid, uh, overload the IDS um, using decoy scanning. So here we're going to say for every packet nmap sends, and this is a feature it has had for a long time, um, for every packet nmap set sends, spoof a packet um, from these, all these IP addresses that we've specified so that when the target gets it, their IDS report will look like that. <laughs> and they'll see the intruder as being all these IP addresses, and they won't really know um, where to, you know, where to go after. A couple caveats with this technique, because I see people use it wrongly sometimes and think they're more anonymous than they are. Um, for one thing, more and more ISPs are starting to implement egress filtering. Um, and so if your ISP is implementing that, you might want to check because otherwise it might block at your ISP's router all the spoof source addresses, and so the attacker will just see you and you won't feel quite so clever. <laughs> Another thing that very inexperienced NMAP users tend to do on occasion is um, they'll say, well, what host should I use for the decoys? Well, what host do I know? And so they'll put down some popular host they think of off the top of their head, and then the admin on the other side says, okay, we've been scanned by yahoo.com, whitehouse.gov, AOL, and ppp478.earthlink.net. You know, I wonder who's really behind this. Um, and so you have to be careful with that. Um, now, if you want to get the ultimate stealth scan, um, I think you want to look at the idle scan um, technique. Um, due to time limitations, I can't discuss it all in depth, but um, it's a really um, neat technique um, that allows you to scan a machine without sending any packets at all to that target machine from your own IP address, um, because you're basically using a zombie machine um, that you pick from the internet um, to sort of proxy that scan um, using an interesting um, usage of the IPID field. And I put a paper about that I wrote. I have it at this URL, and I also stuck it on the DEF CON CD. Um, and so another thing um, that users ask me a lot is, um, you know, what's MMAP going to look like, you know, in three to five years from now? And that, you know, I don't have a good answer because I try and follow kind of the evolution of networks and the way they're used. And you never really know, you know, for sure you can't predict um, where that's going to go. However, what I often do know is what's the next big feature that I think is cool um, that's going to be coming next. And in this case, I think that's going to be service inversion detection. Um, there are a few reasons um, that I think that this can be particularly useful and it's becoming more and more useful as time goes on. One are the unknown ports you see. Um, you might have saw some of those examples um, in the Playboy host we looked at, where they would have port 21,147 open. Well, you know, that doesn't tell you a lot. You immediately want to know, well, you know, what's listening on that port? What is it? Can I exploit it? And so um, with the probing, NMAP will interrogate all the open and closed ports, um, UDP and TCP, um, to try and determine, you know, what type of service it is that's listening there. And ideally, what's the application name and version number? Um, that it's running. Um, this is also helpful for um, coping with, we've seen more firewall evasion port selection now. Instead of saying, I'm going to run it on the normal port, the, the well-known port, they say, well, I need to run it on this port because that's the one allowed by the firewall. I had a friend, a not particularly security conscious friend, who said, dang it, my ISP blocked port 23 because Telnet's so insecure. So of course he moves Telnet to port 22 and Telnet's to the SSH port. Um, which shows the kind of level of effort people will go to to avoid even very sensible um, security mechanisms. 
Um, but, and also, a lot of times, people will put stuff on port 80. They'll say, hey, you know, the only thing that gets through is port 80, so we'll just put whatever application you know, on there so that people will be able to get to it and kind of defeat the point of whatever the firewalling was. And so when MMAP by default right now scans them, it'll say, okay, port 80, and it'll put HTTP, because that's what the table says. But it would be much better and um, less misleading if it would actually look and determine uh, what's really listening. And a third reason is to counter UDP uh, filtering. Back, uh, you know, many years ago, when I would wrote the initial UDP scanner, you know, there was a lot less of the UDP filtering. So you could kind of, when you would send a UDP packet to a wrong port, um, you had a much higher chance of getting an actual ICMP port unreachable back. Now this filtering is so pervasive that those of you who scan big networks over the internet often find that you see lots of allegedly open ports because they're not really open, um, but they're being filtered. And so it looks to NMAP like they're open. Um, and that makes it very hard to figure out which ones are really there and would it be a waste of time to brute force the SNMP community strings um, if it's really probably just filtered. And so with the version detection, that offers a way to somewhat counter that because if we send a DNS server status probe and get a um, you know, response back, we know that A, it's DNS, and B, that it actually is open. And for the other ports, I can put some um, sort of uh, open slash filtered state for that. Now, this isn't entirely vaporware. In fact, I spent a lot of um, July um, working on an implementation of that, um, this service inversion detection. And so let me just give a quick demonstration. We want to do an NMAP, and we want to do, let's do a SYN scan. We'll do a UDP scan. We want it to be verbose about it. We'll do OS detection just for fun. And we'll do this about uh, on localhost. And so here it goes. It's scanning the default 1600 TCP ports. Now it's scanning the default 1400 UDP ports. Now it's starting the new service scan against the services that it's located. Now it's doing RPC grinding to find the RPC numbers by brute force of the RPC services. Then it did OS detection. And now here it gave us the results. Um, and for those of you who are used to seeing NMAP output, um, you see the difference here um, is in this section. First of all, these services here, um, instead of just coming from a table, um, these were detected through the interrogation techniques. Um, and if it hadn't been able to find them, it would have put like a question mark after the service name. And also, there's this brand new version table, which tells us not only that it's SSH, but it's open SSH 351 patch 1, protocol 199. You know, the RPC bind is version 2, and here's the RPC program number. The internet printing protocol server is CUPS 1.1. And X11 is X386, and then it's open. Only open to 127.0.0.1, mind you, so don't get any ideas. <laughs> but, uh, and so that's basically um, how that's going to work. And I think the implementation, um, hopefully, will be a relatively good one. It's doing that it's all in parallel, uh, multiple um, ports at the same time, as well as being able to do multiple uh, machines at the same time, a TCP, UDP, IPv6 is the TCP and UDP work now, IPv6 I'm still adding. Um, one thing I'm excited about is just like with, um, service de with OS detection, um, when it detects a service it doesn't know, but it gets some responses to any of its probes, it gives you a nice fingerprint um, that you can submit. And so hopefully that will help me um, build a very large comprehensive database um, that'll give us um, good results against most of the machines we scan. Um, so far the database isn't so big, um, but I just last week did scans against hundreds of thousands of machines um, to get all these service numbers. I had to stop because of ISP complaints, um, but I did get a lot of stuff there. And so I wish I could give you this, um, release this today right now with an URL, but it's not quite um, polished enough for the final release, um, but I'm hoping to have it in the next two weeks. I figure I'll take next week recovering from DEF CON and then work hard the week after that um, and then release it. Um, but for those of you who are um, kind of real good testers and send good test reports and are really interested in trying the bleeding edge, um, if you catch me around the con sometime, you know, I can give you an URL um, for this version um, if you want to try it out. And so that's basically um, the material um, that I had. Is there anybody who has questions about network reconnaissance, NMAP, or anything else security related? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the windows don't make the best idle host zombies um, because they're always spewing that crap all over the network. Um, 
So, but fortunately, there's plenty of machines on the internet, printers, hosts that aren't doing much, um, that it's usually not hard to find them. Um, and you can use any of the idle hosts you have to scan any of the other machines. And so find a good one and stick with that. In one of my, in my example paper, I used a host on the Adobe, because I was kind of mad about the Dimitri thing at the time. Um, it was kiosk.adobe.com. And within like a day, I noticed kiosk, the name had been removed, but all they did is remove the DNS name, whereas the IP address was still there. So that's kind of an example of what I was talking about, where the admins sometimes take the easy approach and say, well, we'll just remove the name and no one will find it, um, as opposed to fixing the actual problem. Any other questions? Uh, back there? I can't hear you at all. OK. OK, I mean, um, I've looked at Packet Kuretsu a little, but I may not have looked at his newest stuff. Any others? OK, uh, way back there. Oh, just, sorry, that's just my warning to five minutes. I have to get the hell out of here. For a while, there is a related project called NMAP plus B, which also has banner grabbing. So I wonder if uh, the banner grabbing and version grabbing and the new version of NMAP is similar to the Okay, yeah, he mentioned uh, Jay, um, Jay Freeman, uh, Sorek, who may be here um, today also has a version and um, service detection patch for Nmap that's been around for a few years. Um, and he's one of the people um, that I've been talking to. Um, I looked at a lot of the other um, version service detection things out there. Amap, um, Nessus has a very simple one implemented, um, and Nmap plus V. And I got a group of about 30 of kind of the top Nmap contributors together. And so we've been doing these private releases. And Jay Sorek is one of the ones who's provided valuable insight um, into um, improving this implementation here, although it's a completely different implementation. One last question. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, um, I don't think you can fake the root dance. Um, you can only do it when you get root or if a hot babe in the movies um, uses your product. Um, <laughs> but um, thanks a lot. You've been a great audience.